I've certainly universally found that, that being able to cut through the bullshit and, and just say to people, look, as you say, what are you trying to achieve? I'm Andrew Teacher, formerly founder of Blackstock Consulting and currently managing director for real estate and ESG at Montford. From Ackroyd Lowry, I'm Oliver Lowry. And I'm John Ackroyd. And this is Urban Forecast, the show where we talk to the people defining the future of our cities. We discuss their background, what drives them, and the insights they've learned along the way. This is a podcast for anyone who's interested in how we live, work or play in the cities of the future and what that means for the built environment today. Andrew, thank you so much for coming in today. You are a voice in the industry across LinkedIn, also on TV and your own podcast. But I'd really like to start with your background. There's not many people that that come on the Urban Forecast podcast who also work for the NME magazine. Yeah, thanks for having me. That was a very generous intro. It it wasn't deliberate, let's just say that. I didn't wake up one day, age 16, and think I want to be advising private equity companies, great estates and and architects on how to build their businesses. Not that I don't love doing that, and and I've had the pleasure of working with some amazing clients over the last nearly 20 years, everyone from the church and Cadogan, through to Apache Capital, Orion, TDR, and, and all sorts of different people across the spectrum of risk. My foray into journalism began really as a schoolboy. And it's funny this, because I met up with an old friend that I haven't seen for 25 years a couple of weeks ago. And, and he he and I, with a couple of other boys, we put together a magazine that was originally called Balls at school, a, a football fanzine. And even back in the in the mid-90s, this got cancelled by a deputy head who didn't like the name Balls. And we were forced to rename it to something slightly more anodyne, which ended up being called Final Score. And as Graham, my friend that I caught up with recently, was reminding me, we, we'd, sat, we'd sit in school after hours, stapling these fanzines together, and we'd write about football, about computer games, about the cricket, about music, and, and any other sort of faff that that we wanted to and, and one of the highlights was how we would blag press passes to go and see Spurs, Arsenal, West Ham most months and we'd be sat there. This is obviously nineties before things are, have quite reached the where we are now in terms of corporateness and security. And you know, you'd be sat there next to Arsene Wenger or Dennis Bergkamp in, in the press conferences afterwards. And and it was great fun. We had obviously about 200 people read this thing, but we, we made out to the press offices of these football clubs. This was a sort of London-wide magazine. And it's probably best you didn't keep the name Balls then. I don't think it would have helped you in sneaking into press conferences. I don't know. It's, it, it's, I, think it's, I think the sporting world is probably one of the last, last remaining areas that still has a sense of humour to it. I think a sense of humour is being burnt out of many things. But it was great fun. And when I was 16, I interned at Nintendo magazine official Nintendo magazine to give it its full title. And and what's quite amusing now is that magazine in the 90s was owned by EMAP, which was at the time EMAP and Future Publishing were the two leading publishers of consumer magazines. Now EMAP, as as many listeners of this podcast will know, is the current publisher of Architects Journal and Property Week, having obviously burned through different owners over the years. And it, it is quite funny. And that job back when I was 16, this is like 97, was on the Isle of Dogs. And there was nothing there other than EMAPS offices and a massive Asda where you'd have to go and traipse through some wire fences to go and grab your lunch. And it was, yeah, it was just fun. And, and I was engaged and, and energised by writing about all sorts of things. It's football and games, music. And I got involved with a few different pod, a few different, not podcasts, not back then, a few different fanzines. One was for a band called Suede, who some people will remember, quite a big alternative indie band. They defined Britpop in the 90s, had a bit of a resurgence over the last 10 years or so. And and were quite iconic, really, uh, certainly around the mid-90s. And I got involved with that fanzine. I was taking photos and writing stuff and going to gigs and hanging out. And it was their manager, Charlie Charlton, who got me, he intro me to people at the NME. And that was how I got a gig there as a writer and a photographer. And I was very lucky. I got to all sorts of things, really, and was involved with a variety of early websites, things like virtualfestivals.com, worked with Glastonbury and setting up websites for festivals like Download, talking about 2002, 2003, and, and it was just great fun getting to travel around the world to different festivals, doing a lot of writing, and, and at the time I was doing a lot of photography, and I'd worked out as a teenager that being a journalist gets you access to stuff, but being a photographer is what actually gets you paid. Because it's a, bit, it's a bit like architecture. You guys in the architect profession, you do all the hard work. 
come up with all the amazing ideas and the developer takes all the profit. <laughs> and in the sort of journalism world, unfortunately, you, know, you can go along and you can slave over a thousand word feature on something, but the dude that takes a few amazing pictures gets paid 10 times the fee and then can in perpetuity earn, a, earn an income from those pictures if, if you're happy and lucky to get great pictures. I worked out as a teenager that, that I could do that. I was, I was pretty good at a camera and while I was doing a lot of the stuff in, in music, I was signed up by a couple of photo agencies, one called Retina Pictures, one called All Action. I think they're both gone now. but And it was good because they would lend me cameras. So you'd, you'd be able to walk around with this massive old Nikon D1, the first big Nikon professional digital camera. And all I had to do was not lose it. That was the main thing. It was a £5,000 camera. It was the main thing to do was, was not lose it. And I suppose to answer your, your question in a very long way, what, what got me out of this sort of fun, creative world into the, the murky corporate advisory space, I suppose some would see me as, as working in nowadays and for the last sort of, what, 17, 18 years. I was diagnosed in my early 20s with an eye condition called, called retinitis pigmentosa, which is basically a bit like advanced macular degeneration. It essentially means you're going blind. The roads yeah, and the... Co- your dad has. Mm. Oh, amazing. Not amazing, but it's lucky that it was your dad, not your mum because that means you obviously don't have it because it gets passed down through the the, the female. But that's, yeah, it's weird. It's not as rare as you think. And, and I have to meet people that, that had this. Actually, I interviewed someone a few months ago actually for a job and her mum had it. But so you'll know what I'm about to say. That condition, basically, depending on the veracity of it, sends you blind over time. And I got no vision of any note in my right eye or left eye is is heavily, heavily reduced. And what was put to me by the, the consultants at Moorfields was that you probably want to find another career <laughs> because being a photographer, <laughs> photography is not, not going to be a, a thing for you to be doing in your 30s. And then you probably want to be doing something that, that's going to cement you from an income perspective. And I suppose it was a bit of a kick up the arse. I was very angry for a lot of my 20s. I've, I've got rid of most of it now. But, and it propelled me to think about what I really wanted to do long term and, and to find a way just to be financially secure. And I, from, I suppose from that point, from my early 20s, had this ambition and this drive and this kick up the arse just to be financially independent by the time I, I hit 40. And that became my drive, really. And, and growing up in a working class household in, in Ilford, which was Essex when I grew up, I think it's East London now, relatively relaxed, reformed Jewish household, went to a Jewish primary school, but I'm not particularly religious as most people aren't, but I, I've always learned the value of money, right? I was one of these kids that had a Spurs shirt with an iron on sponsor, which bought from Romford Market, that's going to get you bullied a little bit at school. So anyone listeners, don't buy one of those for your kids, get them the proper one. It's not worth it. So I've always grown up, I, I've never been surrounded by privilege now and being very privileged by the clients that I have, the friends I have, and my wife and small baby, I think I've always understood the value of hard work and, and, and that's been a really useful thing in, in building up businesses and, and working with so many of the people that I've worked with over the years. But I guess if I hadn't had that driver from a, from a, from a medical perspective, I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't have gone down the route I've gone. I, I probably would still be dicking around with, with promoting gigs and, and, and traveling around the world, writing about bands and, and, and messing around with different cameras. But and you're a strategic advisor now. It's probably the shortest way of describing what you, you do. That's a very polite way of phrasing it. <laughs> but what made you think, you're in your mid-twenties, having this background in music, how did you make that jump into property? And then what made you think that you had the knowledge of the world to strategically advise these, these clients that you list off now? At well, the, look, so- it, it wasn't an overnight thing. I had I'd spent a lot of my early twenties working as a different, well, I was freelancing in different journalistic businesses and in magazines press broadcast and i'd ended up I, I think probably on account of how choppy a lot of the freelancing is and particularly some of the arty stuff i've been doing i ended up at the dti which wasn't a huge amount of fun and, and through that i met a lady called liz peace who used to run the trade association in property brief property federation and and i and what i was looking for then was a kind of career path that would take me somewhere but still had the ability to do a lot of the cultural and creative stuff that I was doing and most of that stuff is, as we all know is done after hours working with bands and promoting nights and I was working on a, a magazine a print magazine that I'd helped set up with a friend at Empire the film magazine 
mixing fashion music style. That was great. That was great fun. You'd love that. It's uh, very arty. We did all of our own photography. We accepted no press shots. And things like that were great creative pursuits. You're never going to make a penny in profit, obviously, but but great fun. And, and I wanted to have my cake and eat it, really. I wanted to have a, a, a kind of corporate job and, and still have the flexibility of doing a lot of these things. I came into the BPF having probably written a few stories about the retail market and housing, the mirror and the standard and whatever else. I claimed to be a property expert from day one, probably. I'll ask Liz, she'll probably, she'll probably tell you that. <laughs> And I suppose it's on account of not being someone with a Reading real estate degree or even any kind of degree. I was probably, I had less of a filter than most people doing that job. And I got on very well with a lot of the, a lot of the significant characters in that environment. The people that, that became and have become long-term advisors to me, like Ian Marcus and David Marks from Brockton. Brockton Everlast, people like Francis Solway, who at the time was the boss of Land Securities, and, and Ian Call, God rest his soul, who was the, the boss of Seagrove. These guys became very mentory to me, and, and they would support me. And, uh, and when I would have slightly uh, crazy, rather progressive ideas of what I thought the industry should be doing, often these folk would back me. And on things like sustainability and on residential, where I said to the industry, look, we need to have a stronger voice on, on things like housing. They backed me, even though at the time, housing was a tidy, like three or 4% of the BPF membership. What I said to Liz and the team at the time was, look, if you want to cut through on slightly more technical, boring stuff around commercial leases and upward only rent reviews, all this sort of stuff that, that no one in the real world actually gives a stuff about, what we need to be seen as is someone that has a voice on the stuff that politicians care about, i.e. housing, and that we have a, a visual and, and quite aggressive stance when needed so that they know if they cross us, we'll go on Radio 4, we'll be on the TV, we'll be taking them to pieces. And that created a level of well, the sort of relationship the industry doesn't have now, one where the government knew that if they crossed us, we'd slap them down. But it meant that we would be able to cut through a lot more, not just with the industry, but with the world outside of it. And luckily, some of these crazy things that I did worked and resonated. And not everything worked, of course, but it gave me the opportunity to really get under the skin of many different things, particularly sustainability and, and resi, which were very, very big. And obviously now for you and many other practices and businesses, these are absolute stalls of the industry. But for me, they became very crucial when I launched Blackstock in 2012. And sustainability resi were, were two of the planks upon which that business was built. And what I learned from working with Liz was how to mediate, how to advocate, how to advise people in different in different arenas and in different circumstances. And I suppose the role that I took on at the BPF as its spokesman, head of campaigns, whatever it actually was, was to not look singularly any discipline. In plain English, so I wasn't simply looking at how do you work with media relations, how do you work public affairs. I was thinking about well, what's the broader story we need to tell to fulfill a wider business objective. And that's basically what I've been doing over the last 10, 11 years for different companies. It's, it's not necessarily being a PR guy, although some people would call me PR guy. It's not being a lobbyist. Some people would call me that. Not being a spin doctor or a fixer. I'm probably more of a fixer than anything. But it's thinking about what does my client need to solve the problem that it has and how can I help that? And sometimes that might be helping it fundraising, helping it with business development, helping it get a crisis under the carpet or elevate something that it wants to promote. And I've been very lucky that, that so many of the, the bandwagons I've jumped on over the years have, have sped through town and, and I'm lucky to have, have been in that position. Do you think that the background of that sort of journalistic temptation to shop a little bit, Balls magazine, creating the punchy headlines, do you think that's been beneficial? Whilst you in the property industry, I think it, it's often quite navel-gazing and it's often a bit jargonistic. And do you think it's helpful that you're from the outside going, guys, what are you actually trying to say here? And how do we say it succinctly in a way that attracts attention that's beneficial? Do you think that's helped? Yes, but I'd cab out the answer with it only helps if you've got the, intel the intellect and the grip on the detail to back it up. Otherwise, you become like a kind of headline grabbing Boris Johnson bluffer. And the clients that you and I both work with are too smart for that. I've certainly, I've certainly universally found that, that being able to cut through the bullshit and just say to people, look, as you say, what are you trying to achieve? And if I'm allowed to swear on this podcast, yeah. I'll, I'll tell you I'll tell you the two questions that, that I ask people. Um, when I'm cutting through, I'm often, I'll, I'll be the one that, that will sit there with their business plan and, 
would try to understand what they want to do. And I say to clients, there's two questions you've got to ask. What's the story? What's the fucking story? And if you can't answer those two things, then you're not going to be successful in engaging whatever you're doing, whether that's a fundraising campaign, whether that's a, an architecture firm pitching for work, a developer pitching for work, an agent trying to win a deal. You, you've, you've got to be able to understand and cut through with things. And I think the architecture profession, much like construction, much like real estate, it's very navel gazy. It's very good at, at talking to itself. And I think if you look at some of the many issues that the above professions have encountered in recent years, whether it's around Grenfell and the fallout from that, engaging change and planning or the recent stuff around net zero, all of these things occur because the industry spends too long talking to itself and not seeking to cut through with human beings at the other end of the, the telephone line. I'll give you a good example of perhaps where you've applied that where to simplify and succinctly portray an idea is your involvement with the modernize or die white paper yeah we were we worked with mark farmer who authored that report and his company cast with them for the first four and a bit years of that business and i met mark some years before when he was a uh, you know, he was the the main resi guy at arcadis and he'd obviously fronted ec harris they'd been acquired by arcadis and you know, i got to know mark through the market as many people do mark's a, an absolute legend in the property world not least for being a massive Depeche Mode fan and for his birthday one year I bought him a construction time again gold disc that sits on the wall of his office that's construction time again as well as being a great pun on his job is one of their early records for anyone that's not not an aficionado with 80s Depeche Mode records but I, Mark is a great guy and it's a fantastic business that he's built with cast and he was trying to get me involved with Arcadis early on and the computer kept saying no Arcadis kept saying well why do we need this curly-haired bloke to come and help us with business development or marketing or research? We've got, we've got all that. We don't need your help. Sod off. And so I was able to get involved with Mark on Day Zero when he launched Cast, and we were very successful at helping put him on the radar. He's a great client. He understands how to use the press, and he's great at business development. I learned a lot from him on that. And I think we had been separately from that working with companies like Vision Modular Systems and other players in the MMC arena through, they had come through some of my early clients like Essential Living and who were backed by M3 Capital, one of the first real, the first built to rent developer operator in the country. So we got to know that space and it's an exciting space, it remains exciting now despite some of the economic difficulties the sector has had. And I suppose that report really was a, a an absolute line in the sand for putting this whole debate onto into the real world. And what we were able to do with that report wasn't just create another one of these reports that goes into the ether, gets a bit of coverage in construction news and the AJ, and then disappears up its backside a few late a few years, a few months later, just to be revived on the conference circuit. We had this and made it a big national talking point. It was in every paper from the Guardian, the FT, the Mail. Which, big pieces on the radio and tv and it is slightly it's slightly slightly gnawing goring that that we haven't quite jumped on the opportunities that were set out in that report it was obviously we've seen over the last couple of months the government rowing back on net zero a lot of the knee-jerk responses that have occurred in response to the grenfell tragedy of again this undermined opportunities to to use this and i think the failure of the government to properly back businesses in this space has led to the likes of LNG and Ilka Homes collapsing. And we should have been backing some of these businesses. There should have been some funding from Homes England. And rather than all this nonsense on competition and, and monopolies, let's just back a couple of businesses, ensure that the funded development, say that comes through Homes England grant funding, put a mandated chunk of that through modular company one or two, and you've got a market, but these other levers, I think you were mentioning before some of the, the earlier suggestions that the report included, basically using the tax environment to try and promote modular. Yeah, you can do, but ultimately it's a cash flow game, right? I think the problem is that we've got a construction industry that hasn't evolved for a hundred years. There's lots of vested interests there in terms of the supply chain, in terms of the whole way in which these businesses make profit. So creating manufacturing competitors that are going to come and eat their lunch is of zero interest to those folk. And that's the fundamental problem here. The, the whole modular model 
that exists with Factor is it, it requires it's a cash flow game. So unless there is a an absolute guarantee minimum cash flow into those businesses, they're going to fail. And the, you know, the problems that occurred post mini budget after the whole uh, Liz Truss episode obviously spooked the market, shook up the housing world and, and has killed a lot of the pipeline that would have supported those businesses. And it's very easy to say, oh, they're badly run businesses, it's a flawed business, all this sort of nonsense that I keep hearing in the market. But it, fundamentally, if we want to move forward and have any chance of, of building more sustainably, we've got to be adopting these routes rather than finding any excuse possible to push back against them. So, Andrew, you roughly 10 years you were running Blackstock for? Yeah, so I had a bit of a break between the BPF and Blackstock at BAA, which was great fun. I learned a lot there about how about how to run and, and how to not run businesses and a lot about crisis management. Obviously, Heathrow, we had a great reputation for ruining people's Easter, Christmas and any other holiday whenever we could. But it was a great learning point for me in terms of just working a big complex organisation with a myriad of big investors and many thousands and thousands of different people in different disciplines. And I set Blackstock up really around the same time I got involved with a couple of different startups. One was a civic crowdfunding business that, that still runs that would be of interest to many listeners to this podcast, a company called Spacehive at spacehive.com. And we were the world's first civic crowdfunding business, sharing the costs online of all sorts of community projects from art, public art to community centres, the sorts of things that the council would have probably paid for up until the GFC. And that was a great business set up with the uh, the former architecture correspondent of the Sunday Times back back in 2000. He was somewhere in there, in the early 2000s, he was there, Chris Goulet. And so that was one. There were a few others that I was involved with. One was a, a business called Music Metric, a data analytics firm in music. And we'd scrape data around piracy, social media, streaming in the early days and the radio and, and package it up and sell the analytics back to brands, advertisers and music businesses. And... I suppose around those two things, I set up Blackstock. It's a bit of a safety net, really. I was exploring the startup world. I'd come out of a big corporate. I was fine for money, and I wanted just to have a bit of fun in my early 30s at this point, and there's very few opportunities you get to really do that before you've settled down, before you've got kids. You can't go dicking around in your 40s when you've got kids, as I do now. Although some would say I'm still dicking around more than ever. But in, so the, the genesis of Blackstock, really, there was no grand plan with it. It was a case of I'd been approached by a few people that I'd met over the years who wanted me to help them with different problems they had. I was working with a company called IPD, which is a, a property data business, very well known in the market, set up collaboratively by all the agents and used by all of the investors to essentially benchmark their performance. So I was brought in by the founders, the two founders, Rupert Navarro and, and Ian Cullen, Dr. Ian Cullen, God rest his soul, lovely, lovely human being, probably the smartest guy I've ever met in, in this sector. And I was very privileged to work there and work with them. And I met many amazing people that have, that have since become this amazing diaspora in the market. And so many smart people went through IPD and have ended up in all sorts of places from companies I work with now, like Fiera Capital to BlackRock, to LNG, all sorts of places. For me, sat alongside a few initial clients that I had that, that grew into something much bigger. I was working early doors for M&G Real Estate, for Granger, for M3 Capital and, and Essential Living and Urban Nest. And as time went on, this burgeoning grew. I got employees and had offices and all the other stuff you do as a grown-up business. And it was great fun. And, and I suppose it was quite organic in the early years. We had a probably quite a, a punkish record label style aesthetic. People would come into our offices in the warehouse above the meat marking barrier and they'd step over the cat, step over some sort of telebot robot roaming around the office and there'd be tech people lying on cushions and things. It was very scruffy, just pre-WeWork, I think. It was all the absolute, if you were going to have a bit of a pastiche of WeWork, that's what our office looked like. And I, I have fond memories of fund managers and very senior corporate lawyers coming in to meet me to talk about the syndicated debt market or something like that we sat on on, uh, on cushions drinking cans of beer in the sort of meeting room space it was hilarious and i think over time things got a little bit more corporate but not much we always stayed around barrington which is a, a wicked place to hang out and be based and i think it's it's still retained a lot of its architectural soul over the years and and hopefully i'll get to go back there at some point but the black sock journey was yeah quite a long one 10 years and 
And I think with most businesses, no one really takes you seriously till you've been doing it for 10 years. So hopefully people take me a bit more seriously now than they did. But I suppose because I'd come from a, I'd never run an agency before. I'd worked with a lot of senior people and I'd like to think I knew quite a lot about the detail of the market and my approach always lacked any kind of filter. And I suppose that has always meant there'll be a number of clients that I will never work with, people that, that don't necessarily want some curly haired working class boat that swears a bit too much. But equally, I think there are a lot of clients that I work with that, that probably would say they do value a level of honesty. And I think in the world that we're now in, and this applies to yourself and your business, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think in most professions of advisory, whether that's architecture, planning, legal, or reputation, people just want honesty. They don't necessarily want more big bots never going to get fired for hiring xyz type companies they want people that genuinely give a shit and i think i always try to do that with everyone i don't always claim to be the smartest or best looking human in the room but i'm the person that gives more of a shit and that's always been very good for business and so do you want to talk about the sale obviously you were governed by your own 10-year plan of independence or whatever financial independence by 40 so that seems to have aligned roughly timing wise yeah i was lucky that a few of the things i did along the way with different startups came good and I think the decision to exit Black Sock was really I thought we'd reached a bit of a ceiling in terms of where that business could be taken I think the problem when you set up a business is that people often remember you for where you started a bit too much and I think we were possibly seen as being a bit small being a bit being a bit startup-y not being able to do the really big stuff and I'd like to think over time but we've proven that wrong some of the clients that we had at the point of exit and some of the things that we've been able to do in this space not just getting mmc onto the radar but establishing new markets like build to rem establishing new markets like life sciences where i've been uh, very privileged to work with the likes of blackstone and, and harrison street two of the big investors in this space over the last few years people like mission street backed by bgo and some of the reports that i've authored in this space like the life sciences innovation report that i offered that's backed by backed by Savills. These things have helped get different people onto the radar of the market and help really establish and make new markets. And that's been great fun. So when we sold Black Sock into Montford, Montford is a, a great established business that, that, that's set up by some very big hitting figures that have been at the center of corporate reputation for many years. They'd set up and, and exited Financial Dynamics in the early 2000s that became FTI. They then set up another business called M Communications, which, which they exited in. They wanted to acquire Blackstock to take on take on our, our real estate expertise, obviously the client relationships that we had, and our ability to engage really via digital and via different forms of, of research and policy engagement, which aren't how traditional PR firms often engage. And I think they have a really big place now in the world, given the way that people consume news and the way that influence is wielded. And, and I think our ability to use a lot of broadcast media, TV, radio, and obviously podcasts resonates a lot with people and our ability to focus on the detail and on a non-policy at the heart of our business is a critical thing for growth. So it, it was great to be able to expand that business and to new worlds. And I think it's a, it, it was the right decision. I tried, actually tried to acquire a couple of businesses towards the end of Black Sock and both had, had not worked out for different reasons. And so we we went through a process and and that was as in itself quite quite an interesting exercise that that's taught me a lot about myself and a lot of our business and I think it will be useful not just for myself in the future but in how I advise clients. I, I've always tried to exist in a world of of learning for everyone I'm with and whenever I'm working with a client, uh, whether it's on a fee or no fee basis, I try to make sure I'm osmosing all the time. And osmosing is a verb, it's a great one. So I want to bring the conversation back around to, I suppose, the state of the market. I think yours is one of the voices on LinkedIn that I'm always delighted when you post because I, I think you've got really interesting insight. I just did a podcast with Capital Economics. Yeah, those guys are great. Yeah, really interesting. It's actually, that's the next one. It's coming out very soon. So I will send you it when it comes out. But their version, their view, this macro, that's really interesting and and I, I don't want to ruin, spoiler it by telling you what they think, but I think your view is more focused on, it's more London centric and it's more kind of current. What, what are you seeing now in both the residential and the commercial property sectors? I think, look, I, I work across Europe, across the whole of the UK. You've got a lot of clients in, in Scotland, Manchester, Birmingham, Leeds. So yeah, I think I'm based in London. I've grown up here and, and I obviously know more about London than I do about 
the Barcelona resi market or the Portuguese office market, but I'm very lucky to have clients in all of those areas across Portugal, Spain, Italy, Germany, France, Holland, the Nordics, Eastern Europe, and a few in New York and the West Coast of America. So I don't claim to know all of those markets as intimately, but I think there are certainly some parallels, really. If you look, for example, at what's happening in San Francisco, which has got a real downward spiral in its office market, there are obviously some similar issues in certain parts of the office markets in England and across the UK and in certain parts of Europe where once you, you tear the heart out of a city, it, it goes downwards. I think San Francisco has got, some very, has got very specific issues, particularly around drug use, homelessness, which just have not been dealt with by a relatively impotent government there over many years and whilst there are no quick fixes there it, it doesn't need to be like that I, I think luckily we don't have that same level of, of of drug abuse and homelessness here but we do still have a massive homelessness problem that, that we we ignore now we, we fixed it temporarily during covid but but we, we haven't fixed it here both in terms of, of people that are genuinely sleeping on the streets and under bridges as we head into winter it becomes more more visual for us but also just people that, that don't have permanent residence that are sleeping in motels or, or, or don't have that permanence that, that could be supported if we properly funded social housing. Look, I think if we look at some of the... With my clients, I always say to them that we need to have a view at all levels. So we certainly look at the macro. And I think if I'm thinking about the macro trends in real estate right now, I'm thinking about demographic shifts, the aging population. I'm thinking about the climate crisis and, and how... We're staring into a cycle of capex where we're going to need to start thinking about what money, what capital expenditure do we need to put to make these buildings fit for purpose and not unsellable in a year or two, three years' time. Now, notwithstanding some of the net zero policies being rowed back on by this current shambles of a government, I think investors are still going to be demanding this stuff. Banks are going to be demanding this stuff. And the micro aspect of that macro trend is banks not being able or not being willing to refinance buildings and that's you've seen that during this year on offices probably you're going to see it seen on some retail retail assets as well and that's going to create huge waves in this market because once that starts to happen more broadly you're going to see the keys being handed back you're going to see values plummeting and up until this point really we haven't seen a, a real falling knife in terms of values because nothing has been traded so it's a bit chicken and egg if if something isn't sold for a big discount then the market, so there's no discounts because there's no data to say there should be a discount. But once these things start to happen, that is going to create a bit of a domino effect. And that's going to be bad for everybody because it's going to pull down, it's going to pull down the market and that's going to make it more difficult to do certain things. But I think some would say, and I'd agree, that we have been living in cloud cookie land for the last few years on valuations. And there's a huge problem. This is a micro issue. There's a huge problem with the valuation regime in property whereby it's perpetually backwards looking. And valuers will say, we can't value the potentiality that there might be a proper carbon levy in five years because it hasn't happened yet. But any sensible, right-minded human being looking at the market will go, well, of course it's going to fucking happen. It's just it's nonsense to think that it wouldn't. It's nonsense to think that you could have dirty, polluty buildings that aren't going to hit by some levy because it's happened in New York, it's happened in the auto sector, and it's going to happen here. And, and whilst we might have these things delayed by the current the current government and, and maybe by an incoming Labour one. Who knows if it, if it is even a, a Labour government. But there's also a moral question here, which I know doesn't necessarily figure in everybody's financial reporting, but I, I think increasingly it does. And I think my challenge to you and the architecture profession is that you are essentially often seen, rightly or wrongly, as the moral compass for the development world. And it should be Whilst it's not your whole, your sole responsibility, I think the owner should be on you to help guide some of these things. I think I am seeing the knife starting to fall with offices. I think it's going to be interesting seeing how this winter and this COVID season impact on things. And I don't think we're going to go have a go back. I don't think that the working from home trend has obviously loosened a bit and, and will continue to. But I don't think that, I, I don't think we're ever going to go back to fully, the, the fully pre-COVID method of working. And, and that is going to, count for a, a net reduction in the amount of office space we need and there's no way of getting around that and i think that is that's very true and i think that what we are finding is that actually commercial sector is tending to to be more aware of esg and values are being driven more by esg than the residential sector so having less 
demand for office and less de- and more demand potentially for resi is probably going to be a negative thing in terms of building performance because actually I do think that there is already most businesses understand that their offices should be Briam very good at least and that these environmental things figure when they are assessing how much rent to pay. No, they don't because even with the fuel hikes over the last couple of years, they're still not a big enough part of the cost of purchasing a property. And also, these things assume a perfect market, which there isn't. If there was a perfect market where there was the supply of homes that there is of eggs or coffee machines or even cars, although the second-hand car market has been slightly shaken up over the last few years but let's take the 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 auto market or the coffee maker market if you want a quiet coffee maker you look at the ratings and you buy one or a smoothie maker for example or a juicer or whatever consumer goods there's lots of choice and you can purchase the one you want i think with housing obviously you take what you can get so if you want to live in a certain part of hackney a certain part of manchester there isn't going to be the perfect opportunity to choose between an energy efficient and, a, a, and an inefficient house, you just buy what you can get and you suck it up. I think that's different in the commercial world because you do have a choice between A-grade new build offices that are Briam, whatever, outstanding, excellent, and a tertiary office now that, that will start to cost you a lot less, although the values haven't quite fed through yet. I think the challenge that I'd throw at you with some of this stuff is that some of these certifications are a load of old nonsense because they don't really reflect real-world use. They don't reflect the genuine net emissions from these buildings. And often a a new building, yes, it's going to have a better operational performance than an old one, but if it requires 100% more embodied carbon because of all the expensive high-end, high-tech M&E that goes into it, some of which is unserviceable and unreplaceable because it hasn't been built with disassembly in mind, most of it, I'd argue, that these things are, are actually worse net than dealing with the problem. And it's that age-old calculation between do i buy uh, a seven-year-old audi that's probably got another 15 years life left in it or do i buy a new tesla because everybody seems to forget that batteries are also made out of fossil fuels this willful ignorance that we have and i think looking at some of the certifications i'm going to take aim at these sorry but a lot of them a lot of incentivized suboptimal actions and actually i think the core of this is a lack of data and a lack of a lack of joined up thinking in how all of these things are aligned. You, know, you as an architect might design something, cost engineer is going to kick that out, going to kick the cost out. The client's going to say, I can save a few quid here, do that, I can save a few quid here, doing that. It's not going to affect the rent, not going to affect the certification. So why the hell should I do it? And that's where we end up. I think it's interesting that you think that architects, I think we're quite vocal about usually the benefits of low sustainable design. I don't think our voices are often heard. And that's partly the reason that we sit here and do this podcast is because I think the architects are pretty low down the food chain in terms of whose voices really matter. Yeah, you're right. But part of the problem is that you've got an absolutely not fit for purpose, shambolic, let's call it trade body in, in the sense of Reba. Is it as corrupt as the RICS? Possibly, who knows, allegedly. But there's all been all sorts of stuff that's happened with Reba that so we don't need to go into, but people can Google and have a look at that. But one thing that, that is absolutely clear is that it does not have any cut through at all. It's been absolutely stone silent over the Grenfell. It has no voice publicly beyond the uh, the profession. Is it fit for purpose? I'd argue no. Is the RICS fit for purpose? I'd argue absolutely no. And a lot of these organisations just need to be got rid of. The architects, you're right, uh, are never going to have the biggest voice on the table in the deal because you're not the guys financing it. But I think if you did have a more prominent public perception then you would be able to influence policy much more than you currently do i I absolutely believe that that's why we that's what we try to do so we go to the labor party conference next week after next week and we as we did last year and we advocate advocated for our five point plan of of how the property industry should approach sustainability which starts with retrofit and we will continue to do the the same but i think really until we have a change of government we're not going to see much policy at all no, the main joke really is whether Michael Gove's going to stay on, given that he's more lefty than any of the current Labour front bench. But I think we'll have to wait and see, won't we, really? When what I would say, and I've said this many times privately to people, is that you're wasting your time speaking to the housing ministers because not only do they change every two seconds, you probably change your socks less, I suspect. Actually, no, that's unfounded. You probably change your socks at least once a week. But the, but the point really is that 
even when they're not swapping over every month, housing ministers have no power anyway. And if actually you want, you know, you want to make changes to policy, you need to engage more broadly and more higher up. And the conversations that, that need to be had around environment and business needs to be had with those different departments. And there needs to be a... Well, no, I don't I really, I think engaging with local leaders is often the the most effective way. And I think that the Labour Party across London, we've been engaging with lots and lots of leaders. They tend to be Labour leaders just because most of London is get genuine buy-in for projects that are more sustainable, that are putting people first, like in a way that the national government doesn't seem to led to the scrapping housing targets. Yeah, absolutely. I think, but I think the problem really is that there's no real cohesive policy nationally and that's the challenge right? there are some great labor leaders locally but darren rodwell's coming on our podcast in, in in a short while and the leader of barking and dagenham has been very vocal he's very much engaged in writing labor's housing position but i think engaging is yeah you're, you're right there's certainly a value to, to to engaging lower down but i think it's about having it's about having a, a group of different advocates in different places and i know speaking to a lot of the metro city leaders Leeds and Manchester, people from the West Midlands combined authority, that, that there is a feeling that we need to change the way we do things. Whether that means going back to the RDAs of the early 2000s, of, of Prescott era, ODPM, I don't know if that's really going to be a benefit, but I don't, I don't know if any future government is, is going to devolve power in such a meaningful way, given the shit show we've had of councils going bust left, right and centre. But I, I think certainly there are some pretty critical things whether that's around building social housing, releasing some of the green belt, standing firm on green rules that, that needs to be, that, that does need some consensus built. And that, as you say, has to be done locally and nationally. Very good. I, I just want to finish with, I know that you've had, you have had the pleasure of having some architects as clients. I sat with Peter George here, who was quite scathing. He'd just done his address to the RIVA, basically criticizing architects for effectively excluding people by not being able to run their businesses properly. <laughs> the, you know, the, the lack of money in their sector meant they weren't able to bring forward the future generations from outside of the very small pool of people that tend to go into it. Now, what would be your advice to architects about how they can do more, uh, both in terms of sustainability, business, how, how they can make more difference in the property sector? I think there's a few things there. I, I think the critical first thing is is avoiding this race to the bottom that, that architects seem to go into every time there's a down cycle. And I've been seeing this over the last year or so since the mini budget, where people are cutting fees to win jobs. Never gonna that's never gonna end in benefit for anybody. I'm not saying you need to necessarily have a supermarket style monopolies where everyone's sat in dark, smoky rooms price fixing because it's gonna get you into trouble. But I, I think there needs to be a sense of uh, of standing firm on margins and not just buying work because that is just not sustainable for any business. And I think equally, though, there's a lot of people that moan about a lack of money in the sector that, that, that have got nice, quite big houses in France and drive quite nice cars. So there's a question over when people take money out, when they might want to put it back in. I, I think in terms of how architects market themselves. So I think a lot of it's just very navel gazing. A lot of money's thrown at the RBA and the NLA to talk to each other. And that's all great. It makes you feel nice, warm and fluffy to have a little brochure and, a, and an event talking to other architects. It doesn't win you any business. I think from a business planning and a reputation perspective, think about the two or three key things you're going to win business on over the next 18 months and just go for them. Make sure the people you've got engaging in the market and in your marketing actually understand uh, some of the intricacies of those sectors and use your existing clients a bit more. Architects are often very fearful about name checking clients. Oh, we can't do that because we don't have permission. Put it into your contracts. Put it into your contracts so when you when you work for a, a business, you'll have the right to use it for your own business development. Most people won't care. They won't even notice those clauses and they'll be very happy to support. But I also think that fund, you know, fundamentally it's about talking in, in human English to people. Often I read things, whether it's a, a blog on someone's website or a DAS, and it'll be written in gibberish. And I get the planning statements and all of that sort of thing. Some of them, no, they do and they don't. No, they, they, need to be, they need to be specific where it pertains to, to legal legal requirements. But that doesn't mean you can't caveat those, explain them, so that when some opposition group drags it off the planning portal, it actually is clear what it means. And 
a lot of the things that I have advised on over the years when I'm advising on on local planning problems and policies is a lot of that a lot of those things stem from people misunderstanding what's proposed or being able to misrepresent what's proposed deliberately and a lot of that could be could be staved off by slightly more human communication on day zero amazing thank you very much that was a, a very wide-ranging podcast and it was a real pleasure to have you on have you got any final last things that you would like to talk about there's nothing i think really more that we need to cover we've covered quite a lot of stuff i think you know, i'm always interested in 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 hearing and meeting interesting people a lot of the work i do cuts across most pretty much every sector of the market from resi commercial investment energy sustainability and, and if there's anyone that is interested in 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 and getting in touch on on different projects and startups or scale ups or existing businesses that they'd like a bit of off the record advice with them, then absolutely get in touch. Just message me through LinkedIn, and, and I'm always open to uh, having a lunch ball for me or having having people join me join me at Ronnie Scott's on anything. So lots, lots, uh, yeah, just lots of whiskey. Andrew, thank you so much. Cheers. Thanks so much. If you enjoyed the show, then please subscribe and give us a review, ideally a five star one. And if you want to know more, please go to AckroydLowry.com or follow us on Twitter at AckroydLowry and Instagram with the same. This podcast supports LandAid, the property industry charity that brings together the sector to deliver life-changing projects for young people who really need it. Visit www.LandAid.org to find out how you can help end youth homelessness. <laughs>